Good morning, everybody. It is, um, let's see, it looks like I've got my mic set up. It is Wednesday, um, October 19, 2022. Um, welcome to Change the Shed. So happy you're here. I see you're all piping in um, from all over the world. It's so fun to see where everybody is from. You're from um, Can Canada and San Diego and Massachusetts and um, several of you from Canada, Missouri, um, Texas. Uh, oh, Jessica's in Arkansas today. Um, Betsy used to live here, but now she lives in Washington. And um, I have a very uh, spatial brain. So if I've met you, I might actually remember where you're from because I can place you in my um, mind. That goes with hiking. I think that's part of why I like hiking a lot. Um, Smoky and Kirkland, it sounds like Smoky in Canada too, um, Vancouver area. So I'm sorry about the fires, as always. Chicago, Denmark. Yay! Um, Ottawa. Welcome back, Christine. Carol in Maine. Mary in Wisconsin, where it is chilly. I'm going to Wisconsin in a few days, so I wish it was going to be warmer there, Mary. <laughs> um, Bill is in Salem, Oregon. And um, let's see, New York and the UK. And I probably miss some. Oh, it's even chilly in Texas today. It is fall, isn't it? Vermont. Kathleen um, says she just ordered some furu from the Eugene, Eugene Textile Center. Um, yes, I need to do that today to Kathleen while they have any left. Um, the producers of a yarn that I used in my book as one of the... Um, Anchor Yarns Faro, which I have used extensively and talk about all the time. It's made by Borgs in Sweden. They make a lot of great yarns and several of them are really good for tapestry. They are going out of business after like 300 years. So um, I still have vague hope that someone will buy the company, but um, unfortunately uh, we have to find other yarns. So fortunately there's some good ones um, showing up. Oh, Laughing Coyote from, uh, I think you said you were also from more in the center of Canada, um, also smoky there. So I think there's a lot of fires in the west still. Um, Robin's here from Ontario. Yes. Um, I will have fun at Sore Mary. Thanks. That's what I'm doing in Wisconsin. Paula from the UK. Quite a few of you from the UK today. Um, this is a good time, probably. It's evening in the UK, so... I just finished watching Dairy Girls last night. Oh my goodness, I wish that show wasn't ended. If you haven't watched Dairy Girls on Hulu. I don't talk about TV very much, but um, I love that show. <laughs> Paula reminded me because she's from the UK and the show takes place in Northern Ireland. Um, okay, so the next change to the shed is November uh, 9, which is a Wednesday. And that is, I think, three weeks from today, not two weeks. So just note it on your calendar. And I always have a live link. Um, oh, I was going to say I have it on the page. I don't always. I try to always have the live link to where you find it, right, on the page that is right here. Um, if you go to my website and look under online learning, it says change the shed right near the top. And there are all kinds of... Um, links and there's a direct link often to um, the exact um, live. If you don't see that, it has a link to my YouTube channel where you can find it. But um, also that's the page where if you want to leave a donation for this show so that I can keep on doing it and keep it free, you can do that on that donation page. Thank you so much to those of you who have donated in the last few months actually to any of you who've donated ever. Um, I appreciate it so much. It actually makes a really big difference for me continuing to do this because it's um, it takes a lot of time. It takes, you know, virtually a day every week that I do it um, of time. So financially, that's hard in a small business. And so if you have any, a few extra bucks to throw this way, if you get a lot of um, benefit out of Change the Shed, that would be really awesome. Just go to that. 
page on my website. And I will link it. Um, the page to get there is, I always forget this, it's in YouTube below this video. So if you're here watching this video, either recorded or live, there should be a link right below. Um, so check that out. Let us see. So November 9, I'll be back. And um, oh, the other thing about the website links on that page is that there's like, this is episode, I think, number 96 of this Change the Shed thing. So there are like tons of links of all kinds of things about tapestry on those pages. So um, I put a picture of what I worked on that day and then links to what I talked about. So if you're looking for resources that are free, that Change the Shed archive is big. Um, go there. It's all free and you're welcome to poke around as much as you want to. All right. Um, that's all that was on my list to tell you today. So I'm still working on a cup of tea. It is fall here. I woke up early enough today to see the sun coming up through the tree outside my window, which is a cottonwood tree. So it is turning bright yellow. And that was fun to see the light coming through from the east. All right. Today, I am working on um, something that I think I maybe started on the last Change the Shed. Um, I definitely started it somewhere live. It must have been Change the Shed. Um, and when I sat down to actually do the weaving, I realized I hadn't put my heddles on. So I put the heddles on and we can look at this sample today. Um, I am working with, this is um, an offshoot from the tapestry yarn class I did last month. And one of the yarns that I did not sample before that class was this Jameson and Smith jumper weight wool, which is something that I see in a lot of um, yarn shops. We have pretty good yarn shops in Colorado, so we're lucky enough to be able to actually go into a shop and find yarn like this. But um, if you're in Fort Collins, they have this at Loopy U. Loopy U, I was there yesterday, the Loopy U. They have a big online business, so you can um, order it if you don't live in Fort Collins. Um, anyway, this is a nice little, uh, it's Shetland wool. It comes from the UK. And so those of you in the UK, I would assume, can find this fairly easily. This cup, They make this in several different weights. I like this jumper weight. It's more firmly um, plied than like there's a, what is it called? Shetland? No, there's another one. It starts with an S. Um, it's a little thicker, heavier, and it's not plied as tightly. So I really like this uh, jumper weight one. It's 25 grams to 125 yards. And I probably should have looked at my math for what that is, but it's a, gosh, I don't even think it's DK weight. Um, two strands at once at 80 PI works really great. So that's what I'm working on today. Hello, um, Verena's here from Centennial, right down the road. You have good yarn stores in Denver too. I think, I think there's a few. Um, JM's here from Oaxaca, wonderful. I just had a friend go to Oaxaca and was telling me all about it the other day. Um, what a beautiful place, welcome. Um, oh, yeah, and Jennifer has some great information there in the chat if you can see it about, if you need captions that are live, there are ways to do that now, which is very cool. So um, yeah, if you have trouble understanding me and you want the captions, um, there are ways to do that. And maybe, oh, she's saying it's on Android phones. Okay, um, I need to figure that out and put a link about how people can um, get the captions live. Of course, there will be captions once it's a recorded video. They won't, I don't check them, so they're not fantastic, but it's better than nothing. Um, yeah, Susan's here from Pittsburgh. Spindrift, thank you, Nita. <laughs> you always come through for me. It is called Spindrift, is the yarn I was thinking. Also uh, made by Jameson, lovely. Lots of colors. Um, fun, another fun one, which I think would work for tapestry. I just haven't tried it. It just seems more loosely plied and a little bit thicker to me than, but I haven't looked at the numbers, so. Yeah, the, so yeah, this yarn comes in, again, I had all this information in the, if you're in the yarn class, the information's in the yarn class. Um, but uh, this comes in well over 100 colors, I think. It comes in lots and lots of colors. 
All right, so let's look at our little sample here. I'm weaving on a Murex Lanny loom. It's the eight inch loom with um, the Shasta combs on it. And I did that when I wove all the samples I wove for the um, What Makes a Good Tapestry Yarn class that I did last month. Um, I used the Shasta combs for a lot of them because I wanted to warp really fast and I only wanted to do one sample on a warp. So that's a great way if you only have to weave a little bit and you want a fast warp, it's a great way to get one. Because I wanted to cut them off and finish them as I was going. So it was a nice way to do it. Um, all right, let me show you. Here's my other, um, my other camera. Let's put this over here maybe. Um, yeah. So here's the little uh, Lanny loom. These are the Shasta combs. It's an, a thing that uh, attaches to the Murex loom. I should, I always also forget to say that um, I added another leg to this loom. This loom, for whatever reason, I think, I know why they do it. They do it because the legs won't fold up, um, like fold under the loom because this loom is not wide enough, but it only comes with one leg and the loom is very unsteady that way. So um, I have a couple Lanny looms and I've bought the second leg for all of them. Uh, so I highly recommend that. It, with the second leg, I really like this little loom. I use it a lot for teaching because it's so easy to um, throw in a suitcase. So here I'm just doing, you know, I'm, I'm doing basically a sampler of this yarn. Here's one that I did uh, in the class, the, um, yarn class about this is Briggs and Little Sport. Um, so this kind of sampler is what I'm doing for the Jameson. This yarn is a little stretchy. When I put it in, it stretches a little bit. And so you have to be careful about that. Um, bouncier yarns. If it stretches a lot in this direction, it's harder to work with. So that is probably going to be the one thing about this yarn that's not my absolute favorite for tapestry. But it's better than a lot of knitting yarns. And um, sometimes the best yarn is the yarn you already have or the yarn you can get. So we'll use what we can get. All right, I'm just gonna do one more pick of this and then we'll change colors. It packs in nicely. It really covers the warp well, and it feels, it's a really nice um, fabric. I like it a lot. They are um, Tweety colors, so they must dye in the fleece and then mix their yarn. I don't know a lot about this company, but um, they must mix their colors in the fleece instead of, so instead of making a skein of yarn and then dyeing it a color, they take multiple colors of fleece, card them together to create a yarn that is, we might call it heathered, but you can see how there's different colors in this yarn. Let's see if you can see it. This might just be green and white, but it's not solid. It has a little bit of a variation to it, which is really pretty. I'm fairly certain that's how they make it. I haven't verified that with the company or anything, but it's the same way Harrisville makes their pretty much all of their yarns. I don't think Harrisville dyes, immersion dyes, is, die, they don't dye at all, so I don't think any of their yarn is immersion dyed, which is when you would take a whole skein of yarn and put it in a dye pot and make it one color. Um, hello, everybody. Um, Kate, I'm so glad you're here, and Eva from Spain. Um, wonderful. Very cool. Someone is doing some yarn sampling. Um, that is a great way to figure out whether you like a yarn or not before you buy a whole bunch. I'm glad you're back, Suzanne. Um, hope you're healing up well. Okay, cool. Yes, Isla says she has lots of this yarn. So yes, you can use it for tapestry. I'm gonna add a little bit. I happen, 
These colors that I have are fairly random. I bought them various places when I was in a yarn shop. And I was like, oh, that's cool. Um, so I happen to have this super bright pink. It's called maroon. I'm going to put a stripe of it in here. A little saturation. I want, sometimes I'll measure, like I know I just want two picks of this. So I want it to go, uh, or two sequences. I want it to go over and across, over and across, basically. So, um, so I could do something like this to get a rough idea. I know I want it to go four times across. Let's try that. And then you have to add extra for bubbling and tails. Let's see how close I came. This yarn plays pretty well with two strands together too. Some yarns, um, like I have a little more trouble with Harrisville Shetland, which is very similar to this yarn for whatever reason, at least so far with what I've woven with this yarn. Um, it seems to make the turns a little bit cleaner. I could be, it's been a long time since I used Shetland and this isn't perfect. Um, so I may be, they may be really similar. This is a little, I was going to say it was a little less firm than Shetland, but I'm actually not sure about that either. So they're both good choices. Oh, see, I overestimated. I'm going to have more yarn than I needed. This is just a thing I do. I like to splice yarns. This is a fairly grabby yarn. That's another thing I'm testing is whether if I um, cut these tails off on the back, right at the back, yeah, on the back, right at the fabric, after splicing them, will they stay? Will they hold together? Or will the tails work out? This is a pretty fuzzy yarn, so I think they will stay, but you don't want to cut off ends of yarn flush to the fabric if they're not going to stay that way. Most tapestry weavers don't do that anyway. I was taught in New Mexico and in a tradition where they do that. They cut all of, they either feather them all the way in the Navajo tradition, but I learned the Rio Grande tradition, and they just cut the tails right off at the fabric. Okay, cool. I want to go back to this color just for a second. Um, same deal. Nope, maybe I'll go three picks. There's something about um, width of stripes and the rhythm created by stripes and how wide the stripes are and that kind of thing that was what was going through my brain there when I was thinking about how many sequences I wanted. I'm sorry, I'm just glancing at the chat. It's good to see you all from, we've got Sarah in the house from Idaho and um, is it Shishi Mac? Don't know, it's probably just a channel name, but from Boston Cape Cod. And who is warping a Mirax? Yes. Some people get pretty intimidated by how many is that? Okay, here's two. I want one more. Um, intimidated by warping, doing a continuous warp on any loom. That you have a continuous warp, meaning it goes all the way around the loom. Usually there's a warping bar. This isn't warped that way, but if it goes all the way around the loom and there's a warping bar that it hooks around, that's a continuous warp. It can be intimidating to do it for some people, but it's actually well worth the practice. It just takes practice. Warping is a skill like anything else. You have to do it over and over and over to get good at it. 
have so many beginners get really um, discouraged at the beginning because they just feel like, oh, I can't do this. I can't even warp the loom. Well, if it's the first time you've ever warped a loom, that's the reason it's hard. Um, or the first time you've warped, warped a tapestry loom, that's the reason it's hard. It takes practice. I think Sarah said in the fringeless class we did, Sarah Sweat, um, that uh, don't don't give up on that method. Even if you find it hard, don't give up until you've done it ten times. Ten, ten. I think that's true of um, any any new thing you're learning. There's a motor skill involved, and in you. you need to practice. Uh, good question. Oh, Anne's here from Amsterdam. Wonderful. Um, are, am I bubbling higher given the stretch of this yarn? I think so. So I, um, gosh, it's almost um, unconscious at this point how I, how I feel the yarn behaving and how I bubble. But yes, I think um, absolutely adding a little bit extra. Um, I'm going to use this green color and I will, it would be interesting to get out a yarn that's firmer and compare. Because I'm feeling it stretch as I put it in, I'm adding a little extra um, bubble and trying not to stretch it. This loom is an advantage because it has an, a shed that is held open. So I can try not to make the yarn stretch too much. It doesn't have horrible stretch, but it is a little bit, you can see it there, it's a little bit bouncy. Not terribly so, tiny bit. Hi Bonnie, so glad you're here. Um, <laughs> Sarah's weaving with milkweed weft, no stretch at all. Let's see, I think I did a bunch of other samples in a particular way and I'm just gonna keep doing that as a teaching tool. Five, I'm counting warps here to see where I want this. Okay, and then, hmm, I have a couple colors. Gray or, this just says mix. Um, I think I'll use this lighter color because I'm just afraid it's going to be too dark overall. Most of the colors I have here are fairly medium to dark valued. And um, if all of the values in your tapestry are the same, it can create, it depends on what you're doing, but it can create something kind of boring. You want a little value difference in most cases. Yeah, so there I was careful not to stretch it as I put that in. That was an interesting question about the bubbling. Um, see, Marlena says now she can do double half hitch knots with her eyes closed. Those are a challenge for everybody who starts them. So thanks Marlena, I'm glad that's Practice worked, is what you're saying, I think. Um, let me just count this one more time. Five, 10, 15, yeah, that's what I want. Maybe should have hooked my treadle up. I really like controlling the weft with my feet when I can. I weave large tapestries on a floor loom that has treadles. So sometimes I feel frustrated by having to shift the shut all the time. Picking actually can be faster in some cases. Um, especially if you're weaving small areas, just picking the shed with an open shed rod in it can be faster than 
reaching out to shift a shed like this. You'll notice I shifted to weaving shape by shape because I'm putting in a little triangle. Oh, you can see here that this is packing in a little bit more. See how that's coming down a little bit? That also happens a little at the salvage if the warps are any wider there. But just an indication that this is a bit of a bouncy yarn. Knitting yarns in general are softer than you would want for tapestry and so um, I think this yarn has a really nice surface and it's definitely workable for tapestry weaving. If I could choose any yarn in the world, I wouldn't choose this one for tapestry, first off. Um, it's a great knitting yarn. This would be a wonderful yarn to knit a fine sweater out of. It would wear really hard. Yeah, it's beautiful. Okay, let's see if we can balance that out with this. Oh no, Michelle, your cat. You guys, cats, I don't have cats, so forgive me if you're offended by any cat comments, but um, I have seen so many students send me pictures of destroyed tapestries because of cats. They love yarn. Highly recommend keeping your loom and yarn away from cats. They can also really screw up the tension. Like I've seen people let their cats sleep on a horizontal warp on a floor loom. And you know, you put a 15 pound cat on a warp like that, of course it's gonna stretch in that one area and not the rest of the warp. I just think um, not a good idea to let your cat sleep on your warp. Get him a cat hammock. Do they make stuff like, I? someone makes a cat hammock. It has to be, has to be true. Okay, let's see. Lest I talk too far and forget what I'm doing. Let that gonna add another stripe. Um Yes, Frana asked, um, with the Shasta combs, do you just start and end with double half hitches and then slide it off the loom when you're done? So for this, this is something um, I've been doing for these samples, is doing, yes, double half hitches, and I push them all the way to the bottom of the loom. And then I did do a little tiny, um, just decorative header on top of that. And when you take it off, with the caveat here is that I warp this in a different way than Merrix does. And I teach that in a couple of the online classes. I think it's in the intro class for sure. Um, it create when you pull it off, it creates this little looped bottom. It won't look like this if you warp the loom the way that Merex warps the loom. So um, this is an example of how I warp the saffron loom, and the Shasta combs are simply the same thing, piece as they use for the to make the saffron loom. So yes, I pull it off and those double half hitches hold so that this little sort of pico edge just stays there. And it's really nice for samples. Um, obviously this is three salvage, not four salvage because I need these to be fast. So I didn't put up a four salvage warp. So I did a braid at the top and sometimes I just tuck the edge of the braid in, and um, tack it to the back if I don't want it sticking out, but for samples it doesn't matter. Um, yeah, so I think that answered your question too, Christine. Um, let me see. What am I going to do here? I can't remember how I did these other samples. I think I started my tails in the middle, which it's probably not going to work out well for me here. I'm going to add a stripe. The loom I'm working on, oh, that's a good question, Mary. Um, she asked how tall the loom I'm working on is. So the when I use the Lanny loom or the 12-inch 
um, let's see if you can see this. I don't want to change the um, focus, so I'm sorry this is blurry, but those are six inch extenders on the Lanny Lou. Now I'm probably, I'm gonna have to change the focus because I bet that won't be in the right spot. Um, on the shorter looms, I like, uh, I just like a longer warp than the Merix looms provide on some of the looms. Um, so for the Shasta combs especially, because I can't advance the warp, I made the, I use six inch warp extenders. You can get those um, at your local hardware store. They're just threaded rod and coupling nuts. Or Merrick sells um, warp extender kits you can buy. I just want to add a stripe in here. I'm not completely sure about my shedding right now, so we'll see what happens. <laughs> I guess that's true. Um, Verena, if you have well-behaved kitties, you're all set. You don't have the kind of cat that's going to sleep on your weaving or chew it apart, you're all good. Mm, I'm not going to like that. See that little, I put that there because that was actually working with the shed, but I don't like the one white thing there, so I'm going to pull it back. There is one extra pick in there and we'll just see what happens. Losing track of time today, actually. <laughs> Just weaving along. Cut me off in a few hours if I forget what I'm doing. Oh yeah, see, Anne says um, they do make cat hammocks. She has a friend with a cat hammock. I knew they must. All right, let's go back to Oh, you see, that's what the problem is. I started this with, I wasn't thinking, and I didn't do it the way I usually would do it, which would be with two butterflies of this color. Yeah, I'm definitely putting a little bit more yarn into those weft um, bubbles. Yeah, this isn't gonna work out over time. I don't think. Oh yeah, maybe it will. All right, just checking. So here I have two sequences, which is what I'm making this triangle. And then this, yeah, that'll work out. Let's go back and build up more of this triangle. more of this color. This color is 82 mix, whatever that is. <laughs> Mary says her cat chews the drive band over spinning wheel. Oh, that would make me mad. I can see my drive band is rubber, some kind of rubber band like material. I was shocked. 
So I can see that that would be fun to chew on. I guess you can't blame the cats. I mean, we love yarn. Why wouldn't they love yarn? bad I'm probably having to weave more than I would with a firmer yarn which is a little bit annoying it does make a really nice surface though there's two there oh sorry I always forget the dark colors are real hard to see on the camera this is a dark green Sorry about the squeak. Um, I once was at a workshop and the squeaking of my Mirex handle was just driving me completely bonkers. And there weren't any spinners there. Nobody had like motor oil or something. Um, I put butter on my, and it was the wooden clips. I don't recommend it, honestly. Although it did stop the squeak. It's just that the um, copper binds in the, in the wood a little bit and squeaks. Sometimes if you adjust the clips, it'll stop. Oh yeah, see? I moved the clips out a little, just out a tiny bit and it stopped squeaking. Oh, there it goes. I don't recommend butter for your Mirex clips. And you'll see, of course, the shorter your distance, the less bubbling you need. Someone said they were watching my bubbling. So the, sh the shorter this distance is, the less weft needs to go in there. The bubbling, of course, gives you enough weft to go over, over, under, over, under all of the warps. So the wider the distance, the more weft you need to get in there. The narrower the distance, the less you need. Okay, this is a point at which the shedding is just annoying. So you just pick it. This warp also I tightened it last night, but it feels a little bit floppy, so can't see this, but I'm tightening the wing nuts. I'll make the warp a little bit tighter. Great advantage of any kind of pipe loom is that you can increase the tension. Cotton warp will change um, a little bit with the weather and just stretch a tiny bit if you just put it on. Um, so being able to tighten it up a little bit is really nice. All right, let's go back to this. Clearly I did not fix the squeak. Oh, funny. Robin says she thinks um, Jameson and Smith said the letters don't mean anything other than that it's just a different series of colors and shades. It's smart to just use whatever numbers or something for your shades. I think that's a lot of the colors we make up are kind of silly. 
Motor oil spray. That's what I was thinking. Sybil said she used motor oil spray on her um, Murex and it helped the squeaking. I was, that's why I mentioned spinners um, at that retreat. I don't think anybody had a spinning wheel, but um, I would have used the little, you know, the little bottle. It's just motor oil that you use to lubricate your spinning wheel. I probably would have used that. So good tip, Sybil. Um, Oh yeah, Michelle, that's a great idea. Cover your rust loom for the cats, right? A cover over the loom might help keep them, if you remember to put it on. You know, I'm gonna go back to the way I prefer to do this. Instead of just one, of this, I'm gonna make my shedding life easier. Pigtail this one off. And with the new butterfly, add two or weft. Beeswax, that's a good idea, Anna. Maybe that's why I bought that beeswax. I ran across a thing of beeswax the other day, which I did not buy for, I think I bought it before I was ever interested in um, book binding. And I bet that's why I bought it. I bet I was thinking I could use it to sew my merit sweets. I will see if I can find it before the next time I use this loom. All right. Let's do it's probably not quite enough. All right, I think I will. I have two colors of green. I'm just thinking about my design. I'm gonna make the second triangle. I'm gonna do a design something like this. So the second triangle, I'll use the lighter color. And then the stripes, maybe I will just leave them all pink. So I'll put another stripe in here. And uh, make it a little wider. Hopefully. Yes, um, Laughing Coyote, the bubbling and the relationship between warp and weft. Um, they're saying that it applies to floor loom multi shaft weaving, which of course it does. Um, in somewhat different ways, depending on the pattern, but um, I think most, a lot of multi-shaft weavers just put a diagonal line, they'll just put the weft up like this and then beat with the beater. And because their tension, I don't know exactly why, but um, that seems to work for a lot of people. That's what I did when I wove multi-shaft patterns. It doesn't distribute the weft as evenly as a bubble does but in multi-shaft weaving that's maybe not quite as important your tension is lower the fabric is different I guess it probably depends it all depends depends on what you're weaving all right um, let me just finish this little stripe or maybe not quite Three or four, I think three. Try not to make design decisions based on how much yarn I have left in my butterfly or on my bobbin. Although it is tempting to do another sequence because I have enough yarn to do that. 
All right. And here's a tip for you. When you step away from a loom, unhook. You can just see here. Let me see if the handle. Unhook your handle if you have a loom with shedding. Um, you want your loom to be in neutral. If you can leave your warp in neutral or close to neutral when you step away, it's better for the warp. Then like on a Murex loom, if you leave it at a high tension with one shed open. So a Murex loom in some ways works like a jack loom, like a floor loom jack loom where the shed is uneven. When one shed is open, there's more tension on those warps you're pulling forward than the warps that are behind. So you don't want to leave it at that uneven tension when you walk away. Because in my world, I don't know if I'm coming back in two hours or four days or two years. <laughs> so neutral, if you leave your shed in neutral, it's very helpful. Um, yeah, it's quite, um, it looks really nice, that yarn. It's very pretty, so um, I think I like it. Okay, and they do come in really beautiful colors, so that's fun. And using two strands at 8 EPI means you can mix them. If you use this yarn at like 6 EPI, I bet you could use maybe four strands, in which case you could have a lot of color variation. So it's fairly similar in size to the Freed yarn, Vevgarn Freed, that I like a lot. From Norway, that's a much firmer yarn, but um, yeah, this uh, Jameson and Smith I think is um, a good option if it is what you can get. All right, you all, I hope you have um, a really good week and that you do some weaving and I will be off to Wisconsin to teach for SOAR. I'm teaching for a spinning conference, which I will be honest is freaking me out just a little bit. Um, I'm teaching tapestry weaving, but um, there it will be full of spinners. So we're learning how to make yarn for tapestry, hand spun for tapestry. So should be so much fun. There's a lot of really great people there and I will be posting on my Instagram if you are interested in following that little trip. Um, Rebecca Mezoff Tapestry is my Instagram. All right. Um, yeah, I'll be back on November 9. Hopefully I will have finished that sample. And maybe if I remember, I will show you the finished sample so you can get a better look at, um, yeah, better look at the fin, you know, what the fabric is like and stuff. <laughs> All right, you guys. Thanks so much for showing up and I'll see you in a few weeks. Bye-bye.